All right, today we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2. So I've separated the chapter into four parts, and hopefully you'll get a few uh, good lessons or even some teachings uh, from this chapter this morning. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Acts has a lot of interesting things in it. But first, uh, a joke, a dad joke. <laughs> Have you guys heard the joke, what's the first car mentioned in the Bible? Oh, you have? <laughs> yeah. It's because the Bible says they're all with one accord. <laughs> but that was something I heard, like, uh, you know, when I was younger. Um, but I remember him quoting, uh, they were all in one accord, but they were all with one accord. So uh, maybe, maybe the younger generation don't get it, because maybe they don't know what a Honda Accord is, but <laughs> our generation, we knew what an Accord was. Anyways, let's get into it. So Acts 2, uh, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So, hey, the day, what is the day of Pentecost? The day of Pentecost was one of the three feasts that the Lord gave to the nation of Israel. And these three feasts, they had to actually come to Jerusalem. So why was the day of Pentecost a significant event? Because, you know, this is a chance to get the gospel out. People from all over the world are coming to Jerusalem to worship God. So it was a key time to kind of get the early church started and get the gospel out there. So in Deuteronomy 16, 16, it says here, Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread and in the Feast of Weeks. That is uh, the day of Pentecost because the Feast of Weeks is seven weeks after Passover, so that's like 50 days after, Pas after the second day of Passover. Right? So that's the 50 days, that's where you get the word Pentecost from. And in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. So, you know, why did God choose this day? Well, a lot of people believe that, you know, it's because, you know, this, this feast is happening, people are coming, so the day of Pentecost comes, and this is when the promise of the Father is fulfilled as Jesus said to them to wait for the promise of the Father. So it happened on the day of Pentecost when people are coming from all over to get the gospel started of all the Jews that are traveling uh, around, uh, traveling here to worship the Lord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now, when I used to read this passage, and I used to Im imagine uh, all the disciples in the upper room here, I kind of imagine like you see in those uh, you know, witch movies where they're on the Ouija board and then all of a sudden like, something comes in the room and everything's blowing around, all the papers are like, you know, blowing in people's faces and whatnot. But what I realized when I was reading this passage a bit closer, and not, not just when I was studying for this sermon, it says, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. So it's not that there's this wind blowing through the house, and that sort of signifies the presence of the Holy Spirit coming there. The sound is what filled the room. So there's a sound of a rushing mighty wind, and the sound filled all the house where they were sitting. So, um, yeah, it's interesting there. So it's not actually wind, it's just the sound. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire that sat upon each of them. So again, when you look up pictures of the disciples in, the, in this room and the Holy Spirit descending on them, sometimes you'll see little flames above their heads. Whereas what is actually appearing unto them? It's appeared unto them cloven tongues. So what actually sat visibly on top of them was a, a tongue, I guess, like a, like a cloven tongue, like a snake's tongue, right? That was probably moving like fire. If you can imagine a cloven tongue moving, it, it's almost like the, 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 the wisps of a, of a flame. So that's what's above them. So this is what, you know, is signifying that they have these gifts of, these, of the tongues uh, from the Holy Ghost. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So this chapter is where the Pentecostals get their name. So when you think of the Christian Pentecostals, you know, why are they called the Pentecostals? Because they're you know, naming their denomination or their church after the day of Pentecost. And they do that because they believe that these gifts and these things of the Holy Ghost still exist today. So because that's a, 
an attribute of their church. That's why they refer to as the Pentecostals, because it's the day of Pentecost. But let me ask you, I mean, do I don't know if any of you have ever been to uh, you know, like a, one of these Pentecostal meetings where they believe in slayings and these gifts of the Holy Ghost. But what normally happens, well, what sometimes happens in these Pentecostal churches is they'll you know, invite the speaker to come and the speaker, you know, he's filled with the Holy Ghost. Maybe they believe he's an apostle, maybe not. And then he's going to preach and then after he preaches, he's going to come down, everyone's going to line up and then he's going to lay his hands on them all and they're going to be, you know, experience what they're the disciples experience the day of Pentecost and he'll like hit them, you know, and he's got his helpers behind them. And who's gone to one of these? We had a, so maybe some of you haven't. So, so you go to one of these and, and uh, you know, the helpers are behind. So just imagine like, you know, I line up a bunch of you here and then I've got Alex and Aiden catching you and then I'll like slap you on the forehead and slap this person on the You know, they go down the line and, and some people, you know, they, you know, they're slain in the spirit. So, oh, sorry, <laughs> spitting. Um, like a real preacher, you know, spitting. So, uh, so slain in the spirit, and then like, they fall down, they catch them, and then, but some people, you know, they don't have enough faith, so they just fall on the forehead, and they're just like, you know, um, you know other people, they, they may be a visitor, and their friends have invited them, and they're just like, <laughs> they go out into the lobby, um, but a lot of people, you know, they're falling on the ground, and you see these people on the ground, and some of them, they're like, they're like in, in a, uh, what is it called when you're like in a fit? You know, and they're just like, oh, some of them are just laughing uncontrollably. Yeah? And what do they believe? That they're overcome by the Holy Spirit. And if you've ever seen that, I mean, can you, is this what you imagine is, is happening in this upper room? You know, in this upper room, the Holy Spirit comes in, cloven tongues, and they're just rolling around on the ground, laughing uncontrollably because filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, so the Pentecostals these days are doing this sort of stuff, but... You know, it's, com it's completely, like a lot of their practices are completely unbiblical. And, um, you know, I don't think anyone imagines that this is what is happening up in the upper room, but this is what happens at a lot of Pentecostal meetings where they believe, you know, this is the Holy Spirit overcoming us, losing control. You know, they're blanking out. They don't know what happened. They don't know what they're even saying, you know. But here we see the actual gift of tongues in action. Acts 2, verse 5, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout man out of every nation under heaven. So now they're filled with the Holy Ghost. They've been given this gift of tongues. They're speaking with tongues, which are languages. It's not what the Pentecostals think today, which is just people losing control and saying gibberish and laughing and rolling around on the floor uncontrollably. You know, they're given a gift. Why? To go out now on this feast where people are coming from all over the world, right? to then start preaching the gospel in languages that they did not speak. And we can see that clearly in what's happening in this chapter. So they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So you can see that there's, there's, not, there's not, you know, wondering what tongues are. The Bible just interchangeably is using tongues and language because that's what a tongue is. Like when people say you speak in your mother tongue, it's in your, you know, your native language as opposed to a different language. So why, are they, why is this multitude amazed when they come together? Because they're hearing people speak their language that would not normally be speaking their language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So you can see there, every man heard them in our own language. How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So when you see the tongues in action, it is not this angelic gibberish that you see in Pentecostal churches where they're just going sha ba la ba la ba la ba la ba you know, Scooby-Doo. You know, they're, they're saying this stuff, but, it, you know, it's, it's, this is not what we see in the Bible, this, this angelic gibberish. What we see is they are given a language in order to preach the gospel to somebody else. And think about this. You know, when people saw them speaking in tongues, were they amazed because they didn't understand what they were saying? 
No, they were amazed. Why? Because they did understand what they were saying. That's what was amazing. It was like, okay, well, well this person's not born, you know, from, from where I'm from, you know, they don't speak African, you know, but I'm a Jew born in Africa, I'm coming to worship the Lord, but then how are these Galileans, how, are they, how am I hearing them in Africa? So that's what is amazing. But, you know, the, the Pentecostals seem to think today, when you go to church and everyone's speaking something you don't understand, that's amazing. Like, it's amazing that a language that you have no idea what they're saying. But you see how what's, what's amazing here is that they did understand them, not that they didn't understand them. Right? 1 Corinthians 14, we a few verses about tongues. It says here, wherefore tongues are for a sign, look at this, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So why are tongues for a sign to them that believe not? Because you're trying to preach the gospel to somebody that doesn't believe in a language that you don't speak, right? So it's, it's something that is, is used to communicate the gospel or communicate spiritual truths to people that don't speak your language, right? And, and are unbelievers. But how are, they, how are they thought of in the Pentecostal church today? Well, if, if you're speaking in tongues, that must show me that you're saved. So is it a sign for them that believe not? Or is it a sign to them that believe? Well, the Bible says tongues are for a sign not to them that believe. So it's not for something to show believers something. It's for something that to show unbelievers something. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So you can see here, the preaching of God's word is to those that believe on God. That's the, the primary focus there. Look at 1 Corinthians 14. Again, this is another thing that, you know, uh, that's why I'm saying the Pentecostal practice of tongues today is not biblical. 1 Corinthians 14, 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course. And look, and let one interpret. So if somebody's speaking in a different language in a church, even if they believe it's like an angelic language, the Bible's saying here, you're not meant to be speaking in an unknown tongue unless you interpret it to the church, because otherwise the church has no idea what you're talking about, right? But if, look at this, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So you see, so if you don't have an interpreter, is there any reason to just speak out in this unknown tongue? People have no idea what you're saying. No. See, so we can see that the modern practice of the Pentecostals is not biblical, but we see the gift of tongues in action, and it's very clear in Acts 2. Why are they given? To preach the gospel to people that don't speak your language, you know, so you can speak their language. And then we go to verse 9, and, we, and now 17 different languages are, are listed. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. So, I mean, is Anyone reading Acts 2 thinking that, one, the, the Spirit overcomes them, they lose control, they're laughing uncontrollably? No, it seems like they're in control. They're given a gift to now go preach the gospel. They know what they're preaching because people are being convinced of what they're preaching. So there's 3,000 souls added to the church. Then we're given like a list of all the different types of people coming here. Where are we getting this idea that it's an angelic language, that's to show that you're saved, and it makes you feel closer to God, and you pray to God in this language so Satan doesn't know what you're praying. Right? All these, this idea, this is what Pentecostals believe about it, but you read Acts 2, and it's, it's, something, it's, like it's completely different. You get a completely different picture. Phrygia, Pamphylia, and Egypt, and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed. Amazed at what? That they didn't understand them? No, that they did understand them. And were in doubt, saying, what? One to another, what meaneth this? They're saying, like, why is this occurring? Right? Because they've come on the day of Pentecost. They may not have known all the things that have transpired. Maybe they're hearing things about Jesus. But remember, he's been crucified recently, and now he's risen again. So something is now you know, different. So they're, they're probably, you know, why is, why is this happening? Others mocking said these men are full of new wine. So, you know, why is there this mixed reaction? You know, because there's the people that are amazed that are hearing them in their own language, but then there are the people that dwell there hearing people speaking in other language, and they're thinking, these guys must be drunk because they, they may be hearing it as gibberish, right? But then they're actually speaking another language. All right, so that is a bit on the gift of tongues in the first part of this chapter. Now we go to Peter's preaching. All right, so Peter now stands up. 
and is preaching to those that actually live at Jerusalem that were you know, responsible for you know, Jesus' crucifixion. And not just the leaders, but just, you know, because there was a, remember there was a crowd that was calling crucify him, crucify him. So then they kind of consented to Jesus' death too. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So he's responding to their accusation that because they don't understand and they think they're just speaking gibberish, that they are drunk. But remember, they're not just speaking gibberish as a sign to those people, they're actually speaking a language to other people, but it's just that they're hearing them speaking a language to other people and then they're thinking that they're speaking gibberish. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So what's the third hour of the day? So then their days start at like 6 o'clock, so 6, 6 a.m. with even the day started. So the third hour of the day, this is 9 o'clock in the morning. So saying 9 o'clock in the morning, no, they're not getting drunk yet, right? Uh, this time, that's just not when people will drink. Uh, Acts 2.16 But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So this, this event that is happening where God pours out of his spirit and these things are happening, you know, and I think this is what is continuing on, as they are giving out the gift of the Holy Ghost, which eventually ceases, is a fulfillment of a prophecy in Joel. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. So you see how here he is quoting from Joel, but you can see here that you know the Joel passage and this is why it's, it's, not, it's not always easy to know from the Old Testament exactly what's happening. The New Testament reveals to us things. Why they were confused about the first coming and the second coming and things like that. Because there's things in the Old Testament about the first coming, Jesus Christ, coming as a lamb, like Isaiah 53. Then you have Joel 2, which is, you know, Joel, which is referring to obviously the end times when Jesus comes the second time, the sun is darkened. But there's even a bit in Joel which is not even about the second coming of Christ, it's about the last days where this is actually happening now at the day of Pentecost. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So where is this being quoted from? Joel 2, 28 to the end. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So this is a great example of, you see, even in the Old Testament, it's not just in the Old Testament, there's only the Old Covenant being taught, which is, salvation by works, which is not possible. You also see in the Old Testament salvation by grace. Right? So this is a passage that is salvation by grace. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Right? And then he's using this to preach in Acts chapter 2. So what we see from this passage, and I, I usually mention this when I talk about Acts 2, and I talk about this Joel prophecy, is that God poured out his spirit on the men and on the women, right? It says here, upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. So sometimes people like misunderstand, and this is addressing this in Acts chapter 2, they think that preaching the gospel is only a man getting up, preaching a sermon, preaching a gospel message, and thousands of people getting saved. This is not what's happening on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, there was 120 people in that upper room filled with the Holy Ghost. They're going out, preaching the gospel to all these different people that are at Jerusalem. Peter is just speaking to a crowd of the people that were responsible for Jesus' crucifixion, right? 
So yes, they respond, they ask questions, but they're not the 3,000 that get saved. It's just 3,000 on that day get saved from all the activity of the people preaching on that day. So it's not just the responsibility of leaders in church to preach the gospel. It's poured out into everyone in that upper room and it's poured out into the, onto the men and onto the women. So it's all our responsibility to go out and preach the gospel. That's God's will here. That's why he's pouring out the Spirit on him. Why didn't he just pour the Spirit out onto Peter? You know, why didn't he just pour out the Spirit onto the 12 apostles if it's just their job? Well, because it's not just their job. Right? He gave the Spirit to all the disciples. So all the disciples could go preach the gospel with boldness and things like that. Right? So Joel 2, this verse shows preaching the gospel is not only for men, right? it's for women. 120 disciples preaching at Jerusalem and many of them were women. Where It's even mentioned you know, in the upper room that the women were with them as well, praying together. So what does he say? Ye men of Israel, this is him now explaining the Joel passage, right? Um, Ye men of Israel... <coughs> Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. Oh, sorry, well, he was referring to the Joel passage because he's saying, this is what you're seeing. So he's explaining to them what, you know, they're saying, what meaneth this? He's saying, hey, this is a fulfillment of what Joel said, that the Spirit is poured upon them and they're going to prophesy. Right? You men of Israel, hear these words. And so now he's going to give them a message about Jesus Christ. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Isn't that crazy that people will you know, be at a time where Jesus is healing people and he is doing signs and wonders and they still don't believe? Isn't that crazy? So that just, that just goes to show, like it has nothing to do with proof sometimes when people don't want to believe. You can give them all the evidence in the world, all the sound arguments, all the facts about you know, the resurrection, the facts about the Bible, and they just won't believe. You know, it's like these people in the early church, or in the, in the uh, uh, first century, saying, these people did not believe Jesus Christ. And Peter's even saying, I mean, maybe some of them changed their mind here after this they're preaching. But when Jesus was here doing miracles, he's saying he did miracles, wonders, and signs which God did by him in the midst of you. And ye yourselves also know. You just think, like, how could, you, how could that not convince you? But, you know, it's, some people, it's, it's a hard issue. They don't want to be, they don't want to submit to the gospel, right, and, and believe that Jesus Christ is their saviour. Him being delivered by the determinate council, so that was the Pharisees and Sadducees that took him to Pontius Pilate, but it says here, and the foreknowledge of God. So you can see here that God knew that this was going to happen because it was prophesied in you know, Isaiah 53 and other passages in the Old Testament where Jesus is going to die. Jesus even said himself, you know, he's going to destroy this body and in three days I will raise it up. You know? So, and the foreknowledge of God. So you see here that it's the will of man, but God allowed it. He knew that this is how it was going to work out. You have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So, to me, this is a passage where he, and he's going to talk about it soon, where David is not talking about himself, but Jesus Christ's soul actually went to hell for our sins. But this verse here reminds me of the verse in Matthew chapter 16, 18. It's saying that he was having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. It was not possible for hell to keep Jesus there. He overcame death. So this is how I understand this verse in Matthew 16, 18. When it says, he says to Peter, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock it's referring to Jesus Christ being the Christ. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So it's not that the gates of hell are going to withstand an onslaught from the church because it's, it's not, remember, it's not this idea that hell is like this stronghold of evil and then we're like storming the gates of hell. The gates of hell are there to stop people from coming out. It's a prison, remember? 
So when it says here, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, it's not prevailing against the rock. Why? Because it is not possible that he should be holden of it. Right? So that's what this verse, I think, is the right interpretation of this verse. Whereas many times it's taught that the church is, you know, it won't prevail against the church as opposed to prevail against the rock. For David speaketh concerning him, Acts 2.25, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. So he's quoting Psalm 16 here. You can see it says um, effectively the same thing. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So he's quoting Psalm 16 here as he's preaching to the man at Jerusalem, the Jews at Jerusalem, who he is accusing of you know, being responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And now he explains the psalm. Men and brethren, let me speak freely unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Right? Why? Because the psalm is referring to a resurrection. Thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. What is he saying? That the body is not in the tomb long enough to start rotting. Right? But he's saying, guys that I'm preaching to, David wrote this psalm. He's saying David's not speaking about himself. David was died, he was buried, and he's saying his sepulchre is with us to this day. His grave is there to this day. You know, I'd say that they wouldn't mark the tomb as Jesus' grave because if he's not in there, you know, it's not his grave anymore, right? Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So David knew that the would be called the son of David, right? Would be one of his genealogy. He's seeing this before, so it's saying David seeing the resurrection before, because he's prophesying through the Psalms about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's saying, spake of the resurrection of Christ, the Messiah, that his soul was not left in hell. Whose soul? That Christ's soul was not left in hell neither his flesh did see corruption. So this is the clearest verse in the Bible. And I preached a sermon before, I preached before about where Jesus Christ went to hell for our sins. This is the clearest passage in the Bible that plainly states that, saying that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. It wasn't left in hell because it was not able to hold him. Gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Right? But he's explaining that the psalm that David wrote is not talking about David. David didn't go to hell. David was saved. But why is he saying that? Because he, he saw the resurrection of Christ. The Christ's soul went to hell, resurrected out of hell, to pay the wrath of, or to satisfy the wrath of God in our place. Right? So the wrath of God was not satisfied on the cross. I think the wrath of God was satisfied, you know, in hell. Right? But I think there's elements to both of it where, you know, obviously God's wrath was laid on him in the in the in the beatings and things, but also in going to hell. That, that this Jesus had God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. So that's one psalm he quotes, Psalm 16, saying this is David talking about Jesus being the Christ, going to hell for our sins, and not staying there, rising again. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he had shed forth this, which he now see and here, right? So he's resurrected, now, you know, he's exalted next to God. For David is not ascended into the heavens, right? So again, he's quoting a different psalm, and he's saying, see, David's not talking about himself, he's talking about somebody else. David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. So they're saying, this is not David talking about himself, He's talking about somebody else, but he's referring to this other person as his Lord, 
because he's saying in the psalm, the Lord God said unto my Lord, which is Jesus Christ, the Messiah in the flesh, sit thou on my right hand till I make thy foes thy footstool. So he's extended up to heaven, reigning on the right hand of God. Right? So this is a quote from Psalm 110.1. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Right? Then he ends his preaching to the people, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So you see there, what is the purpose of the two Psalms when he's preaching? One Psalm was about who the Christ is. One Psalm is about who is going to be ruling and reigning on the right hand of God. And he's saying, these two Psalms are talking about the one that you just crucified. Right? So that's how it all sort of ties together in terms of what he's explaining to them there and why these psalms are being used. Right? So he's making that point. David is prophesying about Jesus fulfilling both these roles as Christ, the Messiah, that's prophesied, and the Lord that is exalted and at the right hand of God. Now, part three in this chapter is the people's response. How do they respond in Acts 30, 2.37? Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now notice the question there is what shall we do? Because a lot of people think and try and use this passage to preach a work salvation, but they're just asking what shall we do? Like what's the right thing to do? Peter saith unto them, repent, right? So this is repent as in believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because that's repentance in the Bible. But he's also encouraging them to be baptized and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. So that's why we baptize in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So again, people misunderstand this because there are two ways you can understand this passage when you say for the remission of sins. One way for can be used is in order to get, right? In order to do this. But another way you can use the word for is because of. So think of the sign, you know, we were at mini golf. Remember people sticking their head in that sign? And it says wanted, you know. But sometimes those signs say wanted for murder. So that sign is not like recruiting an assassin, right? It, they're saying wanted for murder because they did something in the past, now they're wanted. So this is how you need to understand this phrase, right? Is in the name of Jesus when it says you repent and you baptize for the remission of sins, it's because you have had your sins remitted, right? And that's why you get baptism. That's the baptism of repentance, right? Because you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins have been remitted, that's what it represents. But it doesn't do that in order to re remit your sins. It's because your sins have been remitted, right? For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So notice the question there was, what shall we do? The question was not, what must I do to be saved? So when the question was asked in Acts 16, it brought them out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So you see, so in Acts 2, it was just, what shall we do? Say, well, get baptized, you know, repent, get baptized. because you. So he's just telling them what they should do. But here, it's what do you have to do to be saved? Do you have to be baptized to be saved? No, it's just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Acts 2.40 And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. So we're not told everything that is preached. And you should really keep that in mind when you read the Bible, that the Bible, you know, when you read, say, you know, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, that's just not like a transcript of Jesus' preaching. That is a witness of the apostle through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost recounting the things that Jesus preached. And this is why some people, you know, when they write new, new Bible versions, um, I've heard this as a point of why quotation marks are not used. Because, you know, they are quoting what Jesus taught, but in a sense they may be, they may be paraphrasing and things like that. So that doesn't mean that this is not the Word of God. It's just that the Word of God is not quoting exactly what Jesus as a man preached and everything he preached. But when new Bible versions use quotation marks, it may be misleading because usually when you have quotation marks, it's a direct quote. But that's not what we're reading in the Bible. Sometimes that trips people up. But that's why sometimes 
in the parallel passages in the Bible, it's not said exactly the same way because it's a recount. Think of the Gospels more as, you know, like when you're testifying in court and you're giving an account of what happened, right? And you, you may say, well, they said this and they said that. You're not saying the exact words that they're saying. It's not a recording, right? But you're giving an account. So sometimes, you know, and I might be getting off topic here, but just so you understand, so you don't get tripped up, that, you know, when Jesus is preaching, you know, he's also a man. So it's not just like every word Jesus said on this earth is the word of God. You know, he came and he preached also as a man. But the, the witness of what happened, that's the word of God, right? Saying this is what happened. But what's interesting is, you know, because obviously it's, it's the testimony of a person in the sense that there's this man's will in there as well with God's word, but it's an accurate testimony of what happened. But it's not claiming to be exact quotations, if that makes sense. All right? Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So their response was, you know, some of them got baptized, but this is not, I don't think, the same group of people. You know, I think it's just saying they were gladly baptized, and the same day, so it's just saying on the same day what happened, there were people added unto them, about 3,000 souls. And the reason why I think that's important is it's important to see how God operates in the New Testament in terms of outreach. Because some people use this passage to think, oh, the way and mode of outreach is there are just specific people like the apostles that are just meant to preach to stadiums of people. Thousands of people get saved, you know, like the Billy Graham Crusades, that kind of thing, right? But this is not what we see in the New Testament. What we see in the New Testament is the Spirit being poured out on all of them. They're all going out and preaching. And this is why multitudes get saved. So it's not just from Peter's preaching, it's from, from the work of all the disciples. And let's just look at the last part quickly as well. So the fourth section in this chapter, if we now see the establishment of the early church, you know, as they are starting to grow and preach the gospel, or I guess the work of the early church. I wouldn't say really the establishment of the early church because that would have been in the upper room uh, at the beginning of the chapter. Acts 2.42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. So this is kind of like the, a good start to the church and it kind of gives us this ideal picture of what church should be like. You know, we can see there the truth being preached, the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, having meals together, breaking of bread, in prayers, prayer, praying. Fear came upon every soul. What is that referring to? That there was, there was a respect for authority, right? Like today, there's no respect for authority. You know, authority does things, and people are like, oh, you think you can tell me what to do? Yeah, because it's like, that's, that's what authority is. Like, it's like your boss, they can tell you what to do they have authority, right? It's just the same here, that there were leaders in the church and they had authority within the church to, you know, how the church was run. Fear came upon every soul. But you can see that in the early church because they had the right frame of mind also that, you know, they respected that, that authority. That's why, why do we fear God? Because God has authority over us, right? Why do we fear our parents? They have authority over us. So there should be a healthy fear of authority, right, in terms of reverence and, you know, fearing the consequences of going against that authority. Many wonders and signs were done. So a lot of great works being done in the early church too, and specifically in the early church, there was miracles and stuff done by the apostles, being able to lay on hands and pass on gifts. And all that believed were together and had all things common. So you can see the unity there, the love for one another as they, you know, and sometimes that's what happens when they're being persecuted and, and you know, there's a persecuted group that bonds them together. Sometimes persecution helps. You can see that even amongst, you know, with the COVID and the vaccines. You know, people that are ostracized from society because they chose not to get vaccinated. They tend to start bonding together. Well, here they're bonding together because they're being persecuted for preaching the gospel. Sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat and with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such 
as should be saved. So one last thought I just want to give you on this passage. This passage is often used to promote communism, right? And they say, like, see, it's Christ- communism is like a Christian thing, like you see in the early church, like they had all things common. You know, they, didn't have any, they didn't own anything, and it's just like everyone just shared everything, and it was like a utopian society then. But is that what we see here? See, what is the difference between communism and what you see here? Right? It's, it's one word. It's, it's voluntary. Right? See, see, people trying to use a passage like this to say, well, therefore, the government, through violence, will just steal everyone's possessions. You know, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. You know, we go the way of, you know, what is it, Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum, and they just want to own everything and control everything. And, but no, no, but you'll be happy. And I'm sure one, one of those World Economic Forum leaders will go to this passage and say, isn't that what your Bible teaches, that you don't have anything common? What's the difference, though? Is this is voluntary, right? You do what you want with your possessions, but it's just because they had a love and a care for one another that they sold possessions and they tried to look out for one another but that's real charity, you know? Charity is not when you take money from somebody else and then give it to somebody else. And this is why, you know, getting, maybe getting a bit political here, but this is why I don't think the government should be involved in charity, because it's not charity. Sometimes when I'm like debating my policies, and you say like, you know, government provides education, you say like, well, why can't people just make their own money and then pay for their own education, pay for their own services. That's the ideal, right? So people pay for what they need. But the argument is always, well, government needs to provide it because what about the people that can't afford it? So now you're, now you're getting away from how society should operate. And now you're, now you're getting into the realm. This is why the argument is always very complex. Because now you're getting into the argument of who should provide charity, right? Should government provide charity? Now, first of all, is that charity? See, charity is like, Alex needs my help, so I reach into my pocket and I say, I love you, bro, I'm going to help you out. Charity is not, Alex needs help, give me your money, thank you. There you go, Alex. You know, is that charity? Well, that's what the government does. I mean, you don't pay your taxes, right? It's it's at the barrel of a gun, you're going to go to to prison. And then they take that money, and then they pretend to be charitable with it. That's not charity. That's, That's taking money from other people and just giving it, it's redistribution of wealth. Right? Charity is this. Charity is when it's voluntary. Right? And that's what we're seeing here. So don't, be, don't think that this passage is referring to communism. You know? This is not communism. This is voluntary exchange and selling things and people caring for one another. And that's how a church should be. You know? like you're not forced to give. You do it of your own volition. Right? You purpose in your heart. Right? So it's not, not the government's job to provide a safety net. That's where charitable organizations come in, churches and things like that. All right, so let's end it there, but a couple of takeaways. What do we talk about? One, the tongue-speaking practices of the Pentecostal church is not biblical. All right, second takeaway for you from this chapter. Soul winning is for men and women, not just the men. It's everyone's responsibility. It's not only for the leaders. Everyone should be involved in preaching the gospel, right? So, number three, soul winning is not preaching a sermon to a crowd of people, right? It's the whole church doing the work, reaching thousands of people. And the last thing I want you to take away from this sermon is, when we look at the last bit of the chapter, the success of a church, what does it require? Truth, unity, fellowship, prayer, respect for authority, love, generosity, you know, joy, gratitude. You know, they serve the Lord with gladness of heart. So when you think about, you know, the success in that New Testament church, putting aside, you know, obviously a little bit unfair because they have all the miracles and things like that. But putting aside that, you know, you know, what made them successful is the, all these other attributes as well. So what I want you to think about for your takeaway is, are you doing your part to make this church a success? All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the stories in Acts. We can learn from the early church. Not everything is 
directly applicable, Lord, but we can learn so many good lessons from it. We can be exhorted, encouraged, and rebuked. So, Lord, help us. Help us to be biblical. Help us to have unity. Help us to love one another. Help us to be a successful church in your eyes, Lord, that we would be fruitful and glorify you. So we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.